Many observers in the West question the so-called one-party governance in China. Actually, this question may well be misplaced. In fact, there is nothing new about one-party governance in China. In most of the past 2,000 years since the country's first unification in 221 BC, China almost always practiced a kind of one-party rule or ruled by a unified ruling entity with officials selected through competitive public exams, which was called the Kurji. Furthermore, in most of the one-party rule areas, we must be honest with history, China was by far a better governed country and more peaceful and prosperous country than European states of the same years. And China began to lag behind Europe when it missed the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century. But the country is now catching up fast. In this context, the word party may well be a misnomer for the CPC. It bears no similarity with the type of political institutions like the Republican Party or the Democratic Party of the United States, which openly represent interests of certain social groups and then compete with each other to get elected. The Western political parties, in the eyes of many educated Chinese like me, should be described more accurately as partial interest parties, which means this party represents part of the social interests, group interests. The CPC is vastly different. It had been trying in China's own political traditions to represent the interests of overwhelming majority of the Chinese people. Or in ancient China, we talk about all under heaven. And most Chinese apparently accept this, thanks largely to the fact that most Chinese, most people, have found their living standards vastly improved over the past four decades. In this sense, the CPC should be described as a holistic interest party or a state party or in hypothetical American context, I would describe the party as a merger of all political parties in the United States, a grand collision with a strong leadership and within the, this kind of party, fresh ideas are encouraged, competence valued, consensus reached and candle spirit prized. China is not an ordinary country. It is a civilizational state, an amalgam of the world's longest continuous civilization with a huge modern state, a product of hundreds of states amalgamated into one over its long history. This kind of state would become ungovernable when the adversarial political model were applied, as in the case of China's 1911 Republican Revolution, when the country copied the American model and degenerated into warlords fighting each other with tens of millions of lives lost in the decades to come. As a civilizational state, China's political governance is strongly influenced by its own long political tradition. For instance, the idea of the mandate of heaven, or what I call performance legitimacy. Confucius, as you know, China's most famous Asian sage, admonished the Chinese ruler that water can carry a boat, but can also overturn it. Which meant that unless the rulers worked with diligence to ensure good governance, people could rise up and rebel in the name of heaven. This Chinese idea of social contract preceded Jean-Jacques Rousseau's idea by over two millennia. The Chinese leaders today have adapted this idea into a sense of mission to realize the Chinese dream of restoring the country's premium world-class status and creating a more just and prosperous society for all. The same is true with the Chinese traditional meritocracy and the only the most competent and experienced who were selected to govern the country through the Kurdish system in the past. Today's system of selection plus election 
in many ways reconnects China's past with the present, reconnects the Chinese with the West. This reconnection, to a great extent, explains China's dramatic rise and great success today.